<laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Andre, uh, for um, inviting me and giving me such a nice introduction. Um, today, I will talk about electromagnetics for geothermal as it is being practiced. And um, I hope you enjoy it. I'll try to make it easy. Do, please feel free to ask questions. Um, and Andre will uh, interrupt me. And then you can either speak your questions or you can write it in the chat box and he can ask the questions for you. This way, the people that are watching this recording have the questions directly near the slides. Um, and I have done this before, so I can easily deal with interrupts. So, um, first, uh, electromagnetics is a geophysical measurement, um, and geothermal is the type of applications how we're getting heat for energy uses out of the subsurface. And I will give you examples of new and novel applications from uh, Hungary, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, and some monitoring applications, and of course, Iceland. There are some other um, examples in this presentation from other countries, like from the United States and so forth, but they're not really identified as uh, a case history. So what are the geophysical methods? We have four principal types of geophysical methods. Gravity, which measures the density of rocks. Magnetics, that measures the magnetic parameters of rocks. And we also have um, seismic that uses sound waves and electric or electromagnetics that uses electricity, the resistivity of rocks. Now, when we go to uh, the resistivity to understand what that is, if we take an ohmmeter and measure across some minerals like pyrite, we see the needle goes out, there's some current flowing, we see low resistivity um, as a result of it. And um, if we do this with sandstone, we have no current flowing. So if we take water, which would be in the geothermal case, and sandstone, we would get the same thing. So essentially, we are looking at current flow in rocks. And the current flows in conductors, because they are free electrons, and uh, there's very little current flow in resistors. And I've said this before, so electromagnetics is a standard geophysical method to find um, those reservoirs in the subsurface that have higher fluid content. And then we increase the temperature, the water molecules start boiling, get warmer and more electrons flow and we get also resistivity reduction. So electromagnetics finds higher fluid zones and um, higher temperature zones. When we have low velocity zones, that means that the seismic velocity is slower than it is in rocks. In rocks, the uh, uh, seismic velocity is uh, between 1.7 to 2 kilometers per second. And in volcanic rocks, it can go as high as 6 kilometers per second. And in carbonate rocks, around 4 kilometers per second. So if you have a low velocity zone, that means you have more fluids in the rock. And if a low velocity zone and a low resistivity zone are at the same place, you usually look at um, a molten rock, lava. And um, so why are we talking about lava? Because we, everybody thinks about lava, about volcanoes. Well, volcanoes is the symptom. The course of origin is the outer core, which is molten, it's a liquid outer core. And we know it's liquid because seismic waves, S waves, do not travel. They travel through solids. And this area is 
um, liquid, there are no S waves. It's known as an S wave shadow. And uh, you have molten rock. And then the molten rock goes to the surface through fractures or fold zones. Fractures are within the layers. Folds are going through the layers. And it comes out at places like Hawaii or Iceland um, or um, Indonesia, as a matter of fact. So for um, large geothermal systems, when we look at over 200 degrees C, we are trying to get as close as possible to the molten rock, the magma, that is near the surface and is building zones, uh, collects in reservoirs near the surface. <coughs> the imaging area at the surface is usually larger than one kilometers or four square kilometers. The reality is it can be as, as high as 400 square kilometers. The exploration image uh, area is also, this is a, um, a normal area, but it can also be 10 times as big. And the depth to the reservoir is between one and a half to six or 10 kilometers. In many cases, the axis is rugged. That means uh, complex terrain or rugged terrain. And why is it rugged? Because in most cases, it's volcanic. When you find uh, geothermal energy in non volcanic zones, uh, that is unusual. Um, I will show you two examples in this lecture of non-volcanic zones, one from Hungary and one from Thailand. And the environmental issues. And the environmental issues are related to the uh, poisonous gas coming from the lava getting closer to the surface. Shallow geothermal, when the temperature is not so high, the magma chamber is deep in the earth. It's usually deeper in the earth. And you have a collection of hotter material or fluids uh, near surface. The exploration area is usually smaller and the reservoirs are between 500 meters to two kilometers. What technology do we use to image the surface? Subbasalt and subsalt is best imaged with electromagnetics. We can do electromagnetics offshore and we can do it onshore by putting receivers and transmitters onshore. Here's offshore transmitter and receivers. And we can also put receivers in the borehole to image below the uh, salt dome, sub -salt. And in the borehole, we can do various measurements. In a geothermal case, we are coming from the heat source, as mentioned before, into reservoirs, and we measure somewhere at the surface. But the models are very similar. In most cases, geothermal has volcanics. And as I said, I will show you examples where there are no volcanics. The examples that I will show you are shown here in dark brown, Iceland, Hungary, Saudi Arabia, um, there's an example from California and from Thailand here. And the volcanoes are along the fault zones. And those are the continental margins or the plate margins. Um, continents are defined by mankind. Plates are defined by nature. So you have plates drifting. And these plate margins are cracks in the subsurface. And there are volcanoes along these plate margins, thousands of volcanoes. This is New Zealand. And all of these circles, electromagnetics has been used in the last 40, 50 years. And here, the extension of these plate margins in Northern Thailand, this is all related to the plate margin. And here also in California, that's right on the subduction zone. Um, in um, Hungary, there obviously is something happening deep in the subsurface as well. Why are we looking at geothermal? The market is supposed to be $50 billion by 2030. 
The gross is around 10% per annum. Uh, for private homes, we use shallow geothermal, short development times, six months uh, development times. And um, then you have shallow wells less than 500 meters. And they're mostly based on the geothermal gradient. When you are using geophysics to look for sweet spots, you are actually, um, you are actually trying to find a little bit higher geothermal gradient than 30 degrees C. Now, what is hot for us? When you go to a shower and the temperature dial on the shower gets stuck in the middle, that is usually 42 degrees. So our body feels a shower to be hot when it's hotter than 42 degrees. So we don't need much to get hot water that is sufficient for space heating. The medium depth market, which goes down to two to three kilometers, uh, takes about two to five years to develop. And then the deep market, that's most the deep geothermal or enhanced geothermal systems as they're known, which is mostly happening in Indonesia, uh, takes very long development time and very large investment up front. We are using electromagnetic signals. And uh, those of you that, that were listening to um, Andre's discussion with me before, these electromagnetic signals must come from somewhere. So the most basic electromagnetic signal comes from the Earth's mag uh, magnetosphere and is generated by the sun. The sun has some fusion happening and plasma fusion generates free electrons. Fusion is defined as splitting um, a molecule in its atomic structure. So you split the protons from the electrons and the solar wind is sending these electrons directly blowing it on the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth is right here. And then these charges cause electrical currents to flow in the Earth's magnetic field lines. So what is happening? We have the Earth's magnetic field to begin with. We then add the sun to it. Um, and Andre is not involved in it because your teacher Andre doesn't have a son. He only has two daughters. So he cannot contribute to this. Um, and then these electrons get into these magnetic field lines and then these charges connect at the far side of the earth. And when they connect, you have a current flowing in these magnetic fields, which can be as high as 100,000 amperes. And this current you can see as closed loop current flow on its own, the variations of this current and these variations are generated by the solar wind, but they are also generated by, uh, for instance, black holes, the gravity wave. So the gravity wave modulates the same current in the magnetosphere. And these currents are then um, sending the um, uh, sending the um, uh, electromagnetic field to the Earth, which reaches the electromagnetic field uh, as a plane wave. So we are not looking at the incident of the electromagnetic field. We are assuming it's a plane wave. That is important in order to eliminate the distance to the uh, origin of the signal. So if we um, go to higher frequencies, and these are low frequencies, if we go to higher frequencies up to 20 kilohertz, then we are using electromagnetic signals in the thunderstorm layer, in the meteorological layer. And since you are geoscience students, the meteorological layer are the lower 30 kilometers uh, close to the Earth. And you can see around the equator where Indonesia is located, you have a large thunderstorm activity. So you have a very good signal. In the northern area, you have very poor signals. And we actually can see this signal in the northern area. These are the northern lights, how it reaches the Earth. And it comes as plane waves. The high frequencies get filtered at shallow depths. And the skin depth governs the depths at which these signals are being filtered. 
and the low frequencies go to greater depths. Now, when our signal gets very small, the um, next step is you bring your own source. So if you have enough money, you set up a transmitter and you inject the current. If you don't have enough money you, and you live in Indonesia, you use a transmitter from Australia, but it's the lower frequency transmitter. At least it's supposed to be a lower frequency transmitter. And so then you inject the current and this square wave in the current, every time you change, you're injecting a signal which goes outwards and downwards with increasing time. At the receivers at the surface, which are magnetic and electric field receivers, you see these signals going up and down. And with time, the signal goes down in the earth and side waves, like shown here with this contours of equal current density. Here are pictures of the transmitter and the receivers used in the field. And this is the cello ball receiver. This method is called controlled source electromagnetic method because now we are controlling the source. Uh, whereas in magnetic lyrics, it's a passive electromagnetic method. What is the difference between this? The difference is that in the passive method, in order to see the resistivity of the subsurface, and as I said earlier, we are correlating the low resistivity with geothermal zones and the high resistivity with, in Indonesian case, volcanics. Um, and we get a fuzzy picture, but still we can see what's below. If you use controlled source electromagnetics, your, signal, your picture gets a little bit more clear. Uh, let's start off with an example. This is not flagged before. This is data from Germany, the Orach geothermal area in central Germany, which is also an area of increased heat flow. And they have a hot dry rock project, a um, nine kilometer deep well, which is drilling into a low velocity zone they found from seismic tomography. And they also did magnetic telluric measurements and found the conductor, which are sediments, and below they found a low um, resistivity area. And we also did some controlled source measurements, and the controlled source measurements found the top of the uh, conductor to be around the same area as the low, uh, low velocity layer. And the data we measured is displayed as resistivity transform early time and late time. We have inversion results, and A is when we have the conductor below, and the conductor is the geothermal zone, and B means no geothermal zone. And clearly, you need to have a geothermal zone to match the data. This is data from 1986, 87. And um, when we did this interpretation, we hoped to be correct. We didn't know we were correct. Today, almost uh, 40 years later, we know we are correct because we've done the same process hundreds of times. The near surface is matched and matches the log uh, quite well. Now, what do we do when we do these measurements? Since we want to go several kilometers deep down, we need to cover at least twice the depths. So, um, and we have arrays, which are 3D arrays. They are similar done like seismic. You treat, in this case, 20 sites in one bin, um, and you only have one side with magnetic fields because the magnetic field is uh, laterally smooth. And you won't see the difference in the magnetic fields from sites that are 50 or 100 meters apart. And then you have uh, helicopter borne sites that uh, in Indonesia, you would uh, carry the equipment on the volcano. And you have sites where you have all electromagnetic components along profiles. The equipment for magnetotelluric frequencies, you use uh, the magnetotelluric coils or the audio magnetotelluric coils for frequencies up to 70 kilohertz. And um, Andre promised me that he will compare those coils with um, the squids that he has um, for his measurements. And this is the cable with it, low frequency sensor controlled source transmitter. 
and this is the laptop, and this is the ball receiver. Here we have an image for broadside measurements with controlled source electromagnetics. We had the transmitter sends the signal down and the receiver at different offsets, and they are displayed here. You can see how the signal at the receivers is moving down on the receiver. This receiver unfortunately moved. So here you can see how it moves down directly below the receiver. So most of the information comes from below the receiver, but there is another sweet spot near the transmitter. How does the transmitter look? We have several here. This is a 200 kilowatt switch box uh, that we make. This is a 200 kilowatt generator in Imperial Valley in California. Here's a 200 kilowatt generator in uh, China and a 100 kilowatt generator in South Africa. The data is processed very similar. The magnetotelluric data is processed in the frequency domain after Fourier transform. And at the end, you use inversion processing to get the right model. And the same with the raw data. <coughs> And um, uh, also with the TCSM. Here we have magnetic fields. Um, the two magnetic fields, horizontal magnetic fields, and then we have uh, five sets of electric fields. This is a bin in which this data is acquired. Essentially, these five sets were acquired around the central receiver. And you can see that this signal coming from the ionosphere, low frequency signal, goes through the entire data set. Then when you do the processing, first you get noisy data for the two directions in magnetotellurics where you take the ratio of the electric and magnetic field in X and Y direction. And then you do some robust processing and filter it, the data gets smooth. Here you have actually a salt dome so one of the components will see the salt, the other one sideways doesn't see the salt dome, the salt, the root of the salt. You do immediate tensor measurements. So that means that if the two directions of the apparent resistivities are the same, the earth is one dimensional. If they're different, the earth is two and three dimensional. Here is an example data from Hawaii, and you can see very clean data uh, from Hawaii. The following case histories are from Iceland, Hungary, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, and then an example for monitoring, which has data in from the US and from um, from the US and from Asia. Sorry about that. So in Iceland, we have all volcanic materials similar to Indonesia. The target zone um, was an additional deeper reservoir because the uh, uh, TEM, the time domain electromagnetic measurements the Icelanders did could only go 500 meters deep down and they are feeding a 30 kilowatt power plant in the Krafla caldera with um, uh, their shallow reservoir. And they want to go a lot deeper than that. The objective of the MT survey was to map resistive and conductive targets. Conductive targets being the magma zones and the resistive targets being those zones where you have chemical alterations and you suss the chemically altered fluids and the more minerals you have in the fluids, those zones also become, um, sorry, the more mineralization you have into those fluids, the, they become actually more resistive. And it was supposed to be integrated with the geology. So here we get back to the original picture. You have the magma coming from above and then you have various uh, geothermal circulation systems. And this is the uh, fault zone, and here have two fault zones actually meet. And you can see that here, and the survey area is in Sisteric in um, Northern Iceland. Uh, here is the caldera. These are the roads, and this is the survey map. 
We will be looking at line four and line one in this presentation. This is the 3D area. I'm not showing the results from it, but they are all very consistent. And this is what we started with 500 meters of, um, actually this is about 800 meters. The depth of investigation of the TEM is the maximum is 800 meters. But they're essentially drilling a conductor at 500 meters. And we found a deep conductor as a feeding magma chamber. And also there are some more conductive areas or, and resistive targets at about one and a half kilometer steps. If you look at this, the resistive target is at three kilometers, but there is at one and a half kilometers right here, also a conductive region. So the assumption could be that you have a, a large um, circulation cell of the geothermal fluids going around here. Um, this is line one, which was the north-south line. And again, you see at the northern part, <coughs> the circulation cell. So that circulation cell is most likely a 3D circulation cell. And when you look at it at about, uh, um, um, this is not, doesn't have the, the um, an end displayed. So this is the reservoir they're already drilling. And here, the additional reservoir is this area where the resistivity unusually increases, where they suspect uh, mineralization. Again, a picture of these cells with lateral flow. Um, and on top of this layer, which is the reservoir, is a clay cup, which seals the reservoir. This is only the thin layer on top. It's not, this is not the clay cup, but this layer on top. The fracture zone defines by the low resistivity, the magma chamber can be seen. And um, so this was a very successful survey. The next example is from uh, continental Europe, from Hungary, where we have old sediments and we evaluated the geothermal potential inside the country and looked for targets. Earlier survey were not aimed at geothermal exploration and the data was not useful. The data was also very noisy. And the MT and gravity survey um, we performed was targeted towards geothermal exploration and the data was integrated. A well was drilled on the result less than a year later and um, it was successful. These are the survey line displayed in the geothermal licenses in all over Hungary. This is the border to Ukraine if you know where we are. And here are some pictures of the gravity meter and the gravity measurements. We edited the MT data and similar to gravity, we did the terrain correction and determined the background resistivity and reduced the data to the anomalous part and removed the background um, in order to find anomalies that we could compare between the gravity and the magnetotellurics. And then we looked at both of the results and inverted them. So here is the um, magnetotelluric data. We have uh, for the data, the apparent resistivity and phase in XY and YX, the perpendicular direction. And this is the results from the inversion, the, the data response from the inversion. You can see we get very good consistency between the model and the inverted data. We then took the 2D results from the inversion across the profile, averaged them for a resistivity background, obtained a regional resistivity field, removed it and took a local resistivity profile. Then we looked at the local resistivity profile to define uh, bodies similar to the gravity. This is the gravity picture. Sigma refers to the density. Um, and essentially we are trying to match in the gravity that calculated and observed data curves by changing these bodies. And we do those changes in the gravity by underlaying the contours from the seismic and the geology. So we have the seismic, we contour the geology on top of the seismic, we put it below, and then we define these prisms to get this gravity to match. From this, we get four zones. These high graded fault bones that are, that are double shaded are priority number one anomalies. And these are surface maps. 
And they are areas where the gravity and the electromagnetic anomaly are coinciding. And second class potential geothermal energy only has um, electromagnetic, um, has uh, low resistivity anomalies. So from here, we then make lines and uh, essentially along this line, we can pick drill targets. And of course, we try to pick drill targets as close as possible to the measurement. So this was done, and this is the geology, the seismic, and the well was drilled right here. And uh, this is the interpretation optimized for that area. And this is the low resistivity and low density anomaly that's uh, coinciding. And exactly here, they drilled the well. And the well uh, came in at 1,570 meters. They found uh, a geothermal reservoir. And we predicted approximately 1,500 meters. And it produced 4 megawatts. Now we are jumping to another area. And uh, the Thailand, uh, the, the, Thailand co the colleagues from Thailand called this non-volcanic geothermal because it's mostly in granite. Um, but of course, Hungary is also not volcanic because it's in sedimentary area. And um, here they are also looking for hydrothermal, but they have higher temperatures than in Hungary. In Hungary, they are looking for 85 degree hot water. And here they're looking for 120 degree hot water. And you can see there are five areas indicated in red where magnetotellurics was done. And they uh, carried out for over, um, from 2013 until uh, this year, about 300 magnetotelluric measurements with our equipment. And um, they did a 3D and 2D inversion. And this is again, observed data and calculated data. And the first stage was a pilot and team measurements where they found a magnetotelluric anomaly. And 2019, they built, and they're now trying to establish a power plant to develop the geothermal area. And if you look at the section along these areas, um, and we are looking now at the um, Fang is the second one. Uh, we are looking from here to here. This is a sedimentary area where essentially the heat comes up along uh, the fault system and builds small pockets of uh, geothermal reservoirs in fractured granite. And the granite gets fractured by um, either the um, uplifting of the granitic block um, against the sediments. And then you have a secondary reservoirs inside the sediments. And uh, here you have fractured granite pockets. Now the water comes out in, um, uh, in fractures. And what you really want to do is you want to find the reservoir near the fault zone that's feeding the fracture. So these hot springs are not necessarily at the right spot. Um, and the Fang hot spring is the one here. And they found this geothermal anomaly in the pilot. And further described in this section here. And uh, you see more MT sites and confirming it. And um, then here is an old geothermal plant and they're trying to build more there. The next example is from Saudi Arabia, where we were doing uh, test measurements in a geothermal area in south um, western Saudi Arabia, where um, we are trying to do a CSEM survey. Um, and this, uh, yeah. And um, we, we will see in a minute what type of rock it is. Yeah, the hot spring right here. It's very mountainous and this is in a valley and this is the hot spring and the water is actually too hot to walk in. So, um, um, but we would send Andre first to go there because you know we also sent him to minus 25 degrees C and we can also send him to 70 degrees C water. He can handle anything. And the 2D MT results that the uh, university that acquired the data with our system obtained 
are shown here. The interesting part is they only had one week of training. They went to the field, they did the work themselves, they did the 2D themselves, and they got results within three days after the survey. So quite impressive. Uh, next, I will show the geologic interpretation. And we can see here it's granitic rock. Uh, the top is um, meta sediments or volcanoclastics. Um, and, um, and somehow during the um, hardening of the volcanoclastics um, and the sedimentary rock, fractures develop through shallow fracture systems that were fed by the deep fracture system that is related to um, the plate margin um, fault zone that is fed from um, uh, lava in the earth. And so the interpretation here is that we have a hot fluid cell that's feeding it. The hot spring is drilled here and is fed from this here, but there's more hot fluid over here. So now the Saudis are planning to drill the second well a little bit further to um, a little bit further to the northeast. These are some pictures from the CSM equipment they have in Saudi Arabia. This is a 200 kilowatt generator, MT coil and CSM coil and uh, electric fields, the receiver, the transmitter, and it's all in the desert. The next example is for reservoir monitoring, uh, where we use controlled source CM. Why are we using controlled source CM? Is because reservoir monitoring requires higher accuracy. And higher accuracy means that we need a better coupling to the earth's resistivity. Um, and um, so CSEM, as I showed you earlier, has higher resolution than MT. The survey is more complex, the site space in 200 to 500 meters. The expiration value comes from using it in a complex environment and overcoming the noise. The big value of CSEM is being able to tie it to borehole measurements. And we also can use CSEM to monitor cooling zone and monitor induced seismicity. seismicity. It is mandatory to do a 3D feasibility before doing this survey. And to tie this to the borehole. Now, when you do the feasibility, you start with the objectives and all geologic information. You build a 3D model. For that, you use a log. You then calculate it and you add noise to it. The noise you measure in the survey area, you add this noise to it and you get a noise spectrum like here. And then you calculate a 3D model where you look at the difference from the curves from the transmitter. Here we have receivers. And here we have a hot or cool geothermal reservoir. And we determine if we can see the difference. If we would have used this system, we wouldn't have been able to see the difference. But if we use a large area air loop, we do see the difference here. And so we choose this particular loop for this survey. Um, and, and the other example uh, that I, we used where we carried this out, we have the log displayed. So when we mean we match it to the log, we are averaging the log and develop an anisotropic model, which has two horizontal resistivities in blue and one vertical resistivity in pink. And this is how these logs are averaged. And we are matching the surface data to this particular model. And here's an example from North Dakota, where we are targeting to map two reservoirs, 1.6 and three kilometer steps. And when you do these 3D models, you get response curves and they are in black here, but the noise can be sometimes covering it and we can't see anything. So we do take the difference of measurements and that's why you have to use CSEM because in the monitoring case, you have much, much smaller differences.
And here you have the, um, the reservoir um, has cooled um, on the outer rim and in a hundred meters, no, the injection, the cold water injection in the reservoir is from the center in a hundred meters. Um, and here the cold water, um, there is no cold water injection and you get um, a much larger response. So you can see the difference between the cooling zones and the hot zones. Again, to show you the difference between magnetic tellurics, this is the 2D MT profile uh, with the magnetic tellurics and the CSEM data where the two reservoirs are visible in the CSEM. This is the 3D modeling response and the magnetic field and the EY electric field matches the 3D model response from the borehole here because this is a weaker signal in the X direction, the signal disappears in the noise from here on, but before that it also matches. So this is a shallower reservoir and this is the deeper part of the reservoir. So this sees the reservoir at 1600 meters and these two see the reservoir at 1600 meters and at three kilometers. So what do you want to do next time? You want to combine seismic and electromagnetics. And here are, uh, uh, models where we use tomographic data. Tomographic data means that um, uh, we use a, a, a mine explosion in Australia and we measure the seismic signal in Indonesia. We synchronize the time of multiple receivers and we try to image this. And the seismic synthetic data is here. It normally sees nothing. The EM sees it already. Um, and if we go and uh, go by the iterations and constrain the seismic data with the EM data, then both data that sets actually see the low velocity zone and um, the, in this case, high resistivity zone. So the, here you would look in a volcanic section for an area where you have a higher degree of mineralization of the geothermal reservoir. Question to Andre, the speaker, uh, the host. Where do you have in uh, Indonesia an old active volcano? Well, we have in Sumatra, in Lampung, as well. For the oldest volcano, you would look for a resistive zone target. And for a young volcano, you would look for a conductive zone target. So, so far, we have reviewed the M method, magnetic tellurics and CSEM mostly for land, but we can also do that offshore. We use magnetic tellurics for the background and CSEM for detail. Both are key exploration techniques and can be used more for production and monitoring for geothermal and oil. The ball calibration is mandatory to get uh, better uh, confidence in your data and reduce the risk, and then be able to drill with more confidence. And uh, from a hardware viewpoint, you need an array system and high power transmitter. And the geothermal market is undergoing this time a very big growth. And uh, in the future, we expect seismic EM is acquired together. <coughs> more in integration and more monitoring is being done. And last but not least, the highest value, like 100% of the value you obtain by emplacing permanent sensors. So when you emplace these sensors permanently, you only spend 20% of the cost, but you realize between 80 to 100% of the value. Today, we are still at the beginning of using surface measurement. When we have fully borrower integrated systems, we get another 20%. When we have fully calibrated systems, we get another 20% and semi-permanent another one. So why are we increasing this percentage? The percentage is all related to risk reduction. The cost is always in the risk. You always want to make sure you're not losing when you spend this huge amount of drilling money. And drilling geothermal wells is very expensive. So um, this is the summary with the references. And um, uh, Andrew will send you an email. You can get access to our learning center where you will find the presentation and the video later on. 
and uh, you can download the PowerPoint um, from there and you can get all kinds of references also. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Kurt. And uh, now it's time for the questions. Anyone has question, please raise your hand or you, or you can uh, type your uh, question in chat box. Yeah, silakan kalau ada yang mau bertanya. Okay, silakan. Kurt, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Silakan kalau ada yang mau bertanya. Okay, I think they are so shy, so I'll give a question. They can okay. speak in Bahasa or they can chat. Okay, Erwin, go ahead. Please introduce yourself first and then you can ask the question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, hello, Mr. Kurt. Thank you for your presentation today. Uh, so I'm Ernest Prankuti from Sumara Institute of Technology. So I uh, want to ask you, uh, it's kind of more general question actually. So in Indonesia, as we know that there are so many potential of geothermal, but only 5% statically that utilize or install. So uh, the other is uh, not explore or maybe unexplored. So my question is, especially in study case in Indonesia, so what is the better uh, method in electromagnetic? I mean, electromagnetic has uh, so many branch methods such as PLF, TEM, or maybe MT, CS, IMT. And then my question is, what is the better method to explore? The we need to use CSEM in Indonesia. Uh, CSAMT is only an excuse to improve MT because you have a lot of MT companies and systems in Indonesia. A CSEM system uh, costs a million dollars and nobody wants to spend it. Yeah. And in addition to it, uh, in Indonesia, you ha have interest in a lot of areas where there are a lot of people. And if there are people, there are power lines. So you need to use modern technology to overcome the noise in power lines. So most of the MT measurements in Indonesia are no good. And you also need to train people to process the data correctly. So um, it's very clear that you need to use CSEM, but nobody wants to spend the money to do this. So that's why the CSEM measurements have only been done there where people brought the CSEM system, Iceland, <coughs> New Zealand, Australia, um, Europe, Germany, um, Nicaragua, US, um, those, Saudi Arabia. Those are all the areas where they were using CSEM systems where they are wildly successful. Um, it is very important to understand when your data is correct or not. And when you have noise, you have to do good processing. And you also need to have good 3D models. Well, the 3D modeling is only recently getting very good. Okay, Mr. Kurt, maybe you just literally answer my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Erwin. Uh, is any one want to give a question? Ada lagi yang mau bertanya silakan ya. Yang mau bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia juga silakan ya. Kalau ada yang mau bertanya nanti saya coba translate atau mungkin ada yang lain yang bisa ya. Silakan. Ada lagi yang lain? Oke, okay, anyone? Oke, okay, uh, uh, just to inform you uh, everyone, I mean uh, Kurt also actually the geothermal potential in Indonesia is quite high. Uh, it's very, uh, we have very large potential, but uh, the problem also here is not only about the exploration itself, but it's also about investment for uh, to do exploitation. So I just have uh, uh, some information from the uh, separate people that uh, 
especially like in Lampung uh, near our campus is uh, we have export uh, at least two geothermal area uh, is already complete uh, for uh, the manifestation and then also the depth of, of the reservoirs including uh, for the wells but uh, the, the problem is just the investment how to, pro to produce the geothermal so yeah, uh, it's quite unique here. Uh, yeah, I think that's all that I can uh, inform uh, about that. So, all right. Um, is anyone want to have question? No. Okay. So, uh, I think no one want to give question codes, and I uh, I have one uh, question uh, about the uh, exploration in the low geo, low temperature geothermal system um uh, actually, uh i mean uh, where the temperatures from i think this is, this is the same from the uh, magma uh, because we know that granite is intrusive rocks right so um is it related to the magma itself or uh, is that uh like uh, different uh systems okay Thank you. Um, I will show you a slide. And so you have the um, outer core is um, has um, magma in it. And so the heat from the outer core goes up everywhere. So you have a normal geothermal gradient of 30 degrees centigrade per kilometer. And as I said before, if you drill a well that's two and a half kilometers deep, you will have 85 degrees centigrade minimum. If you drill that well in an area where you have some proximity through some uh, secondary reservoirs that is collecting hot water or the temperature and has some geothermal fluid cells, then you will get higher temperature and you can produce electricity in addition to it. 85 degree temperature is enough for space heating, greenhouses, hot springs, and electricity production on a smaller scale. Okay. 120 degrees allows you quite a big sale of electricity to the power grid. So, uh, essentially, you uh, Indonesia is along one of these. So Iceland is here, Hawaii is here. So Indonesia would be somewhere in the lower half. Um, and so in Indonesia, you do not have to drill that deep to get high temperature. So the uh, we can actually quickly look this up and um, tell Google average geothermal gradient in Indonesia. And it will tell us. Um, geothermal flow map of uh, Sumatra, Indonesia. And then the other one would be it. So gradient and heat flow. This is 35 degrees per kilometer. So I think it's higher than that. Uh, geothermal map of Sumatra. Um, we now will get a map and it will tell us the temperature. And you will see that the geothermal gradient in Indonesia is probably 40 uh, degrees. Regional map, geothermal gradient. This is Sumatra. Um, what per kilometers? Idiots. I want to in centigrades geothermal gradient. So let's enlarge this. And uh, you know uh, where okay. this is, right? So yeah, here you have a temperature of 100 degrees per kilometer. Per kilometer. 
And so I said it should be at least uh, uh, 40 kilometers. The literature search said 32. So you have some cool spots of 35. So it is, it is um, uh, about 60 degrees. So you have about 50 degrees per kilometer. So two kilometer wells in Sumatra will give you a power plant that you can put electricity to the power grid. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Kurt, for, for the answer. And uh, the last chance for everyone who want to ask the question. Ada lagi yang mau bertanya? Silakan. Ini kesempatan terakhir ya. Okay, ada? Okay, I think uh, there's no more question, Kurt. And uh, I, I actually is uh, very happy uh, to having you today here. And I think also for the students, uh, they actually quite shy uh, for the moment. Uh, probably in the future, they would have more questions, I think. And okay, and if you, anyone want to give question after this lecture, you can actually send me the email or message and then I will forward to Mr. Kurt. Okay, and uh, thank you everyone. And thank you Kurt for your time and uh, this is a really good material. I will uh, actually forward to the student after that so they can learn more and maybe uh, have more questions. Okay, and uh, this is the end of our meeting for today. And again, I uh, appreciate for, for your time, Kurt, and also for everybody who come this meeting. And well, thank you for having me, giving me the opportunity to do this and wearing my Indonesian shirt. All oh, right, yeah, it is Indonesian shirt. I know that this is very expensive, uh, expensive shirt, I think. Handmade in Bandung. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye, Kurt. Thank you so much. See you. Okay, yang lain bisa. Okay, uh, tunggu dulu ya. Uh, ada yang I think disampaikan. Okay, Kurt, bye. I want to uh, give some. Uh... Stop recording. Okay, all right.